Uh, the one on the right is by Joyce Kosloff. It's Dark and Light, Light Continents from the early 2000s. It's uh, about climate change to some extent. And though it's a great big piece showing where the energy is being used. The one on the left is by Janet Culbertson. On the other end, it's called uh, Billboard Wetlands. It's the, what, what we're going to get very soon if we don't do something about climate change, which is uh, nothing but a billboard left. On the other hand, earnestness and sincerity and conviction tend to be uninteresting to the art world, not edgy enough. Irony and satire have become the primary tools of social statement among activists and political artists because it's a lot harder to make a positive statement, vivid and real, than it is to diss something or somebody. Yet most people, regardless of class or education level, need some kind of entrance, some clues within the art or in the titles for those viewers who don't get it. Not because they're dumb, but because they don't read the art magazines. Avant-garde artists have been trained to do what they like in their art world bubble, or sandbox, and often refuse to consider who they're doing it to. In the process, they've lost a lot of public support and have fed into the righteous fury of right-wing nutcases. <laughs> I certainly don't feel that artists should pull their punches and try to please everybody. Self-censorship is really the greatest evil of all. But just to make people mad is an adolescent pursuit and not worthy of the role art's supposed to play in society. Progressive artists often labor under the illusion that we're making a people's art, instead of facing the fact that we're usually hanging out in the avant-garde and just wanting to make art more people can relate to. The reach for huge new audiences can exceed an artist's grasp to the point of absurdity, often resulting in a very small audience, because the producer hasn't taken into consideration what the political context really is. The one on the left is by Wanda Hammerbeck. If you can't read the thing at the bottom, it says nearly you know, one-third of the species extinct in our lifetime. The one on the right is by Rebecca Di Domenico, uh, done for a show on climate change. It's called Between Worlds, Wildlife Adapting to Climate Change. So she's made all these weird hybrid creatures that uh, will, will have to be around. So art isn't any different from life when it comes to ethics. The labyrinth beckons, every situation is loaded. But art isn't life, you can argue. Art has a kind of permanent innocence in this culture. We, spend, we expect very little of it. We expect nothing of it. We expect everything of it, depending on who we are. The real problem is that art itself has no genuine context in this society. And my favorite line about art and life comes from the fluxus artist, Robert Filiou. Art is what makes life more interesting than art. <laughs> the uh, one on the left is a right that needs focusing, I think, or that, that left projector always has problems. Um, it's a rape piece by Anna Mendieta, made when she was in graduate school in Iowa. People were told it was a performance piece, if you can use that word for this kind of grim subject matter. But you, people were told to go to a certain place in the woods, and they came across her body. Uh, the one on the right is by Deborah Bright, uh, a wonderful series called Dream Girls, in which she inserts herself into famous movie stills. <laughs> so she's getting to light the lady's cigarette. <laughs> so around 1970, feminist art brought with it the resurrection of content, of narrative forms, of traditional arts, autobiography, storytelling, performance, documentary photography, affinities with the politics and creativity of global cultures, all ways of bringing the details of daily life into the art context where they can be understood within a broader frame. I've always been obsessed with the collage aesthetic that defines so much feminist art, and I say this every time I talk or write, it seems like. It, collage defines so much feminist art, a sort of layered cumulative mold. Mold. <laughs> mold, mold. <laughs> From Hannah Hirk to, uh, to Deborah Bright or Anna Mendieta, Collage or montage has always been a particularly effective medium for a political art. Humorous and hard-hitting, it can bring separate realities together in an endless different ways. Collage or montage, though it was first exploited by modernism, is also the core strategy of postmodernism, if that's still around. It represents a dialogic approach. Collage is about shifting relationships, juxtaposition and superimposition, gluing and ungluing. It's an aesthetic that willfully takes apart what is or what is supposed to be and rearranges it in ways that suggest what it could be. Collage makes something of contradictions. It contains the possibility of visual puns and accessible contrasts and irony. 
It's also the medium of surprise, which can shake us out of our stupors. And collaboration is the social extension of the collage aesthetic, and it characterizes a lot of women's art. The uh, one on the left is another Suzanne Lacey uh, freeze frame room for living. Hundred women from very different backgrounds met to discuss life in um, a furniture showroom in San Francisco. And, and it had these, these tableaus. I mean, Suzanne's work is always very strongly visual, even though the social content is maybe the main part of it. And the one on the right is Carol H. Neyman's famous Meet Joy from 1964, a different kind of collaboration. <laughs> so collaboration has long been a weapon against the powerful sense of individual alienation that characterizes late capitalism, which divides and separates through specialization at the same time that it homogenizes. Putting things together without divesting them of their own identities is a metaphor for cultural democracy, the diametric opposite of a homogenizing global corporate culture. This has been the impetus for the proliferation of a lot of new young international collectives, which for my money are the future of responsible art, sort of DIY groups and future farmers, temporary services, and there are a million of them, luckily, LTTR. Activist art is a collaboration with those who are living the issues. The bright idea may be the artists, but it's fulfilled by exchange rather than imposition from outside or above. Ideally, activist art isn't a new formalist or new faddish art form. It's a massing of energies, suggesting new ways for artists to connect with the sources of energy and their own lived experiences. And we could use a lot more of that today. The one on the left is uh, a collaborative group called Carnival Knowledge, which did stuff on reproductive rights in, in New York at the Furnace, at Franklin Furnace, and, and other places, mostly in public, actually. And the one on the, uh, that's the one on the left. The one on the right is by Sister Serpents, another group, and it sort of speaks for itself. I wrote in the 70s, and I still earnestly believe, without much confidence of satisfaction, that women are in a privileged position to satisfy the goal of an art that could communicate the needs of all classes, races, and genders to each other and get rid of the we-they dichotomy to as great an extent as is possible in a capitalist framework. Only when politics are truly internalized can they be effectively conveyed through form. Those of us who identified with socialist feminism in the 70s and 80s were struggling with the contradictions between Marxism and feminism, horizontal and vertical class structures. Eventually, it became clear that mere resistance was confining, that we could survive outside the art world and create our own formal and intellectual spaces. Feminism's greatest contribution to the future of art has probably been precisely its lack of contribution to modernism, I pontificated in 1980. Modernism was about consecrated truths, and feminism provided a rupture, a real paradigm shift, to use an overworked phrase. Truth with a capital T hasn't been the same since, but precisely because feminism escaped or ignored the modernist canon, it was a watershed that had huge impact on contemporary art of the last 30 years, an impact that is, of course, usually ignored. As Elizabeth Hess once said, uh, they, they, people would say nothing ever happened in the 70s. What they meant was feminism happened in the 70s. This is uh, the one on the left by Valerie So. It's called Mixed Blood from the 90s. And the one on the right is Pests, a group of women of color who uh, sort of paralleled the Gorilla Girls in New York on street stuff. At one point in the 80s, a woman told me I wasn't considered a feminist anymore because I was too interested in the third world. I was seriously, seriously alarmed at such a narrow definition of feminism but it highlighted a problem for feminist art activism, which was the lack of solid ongoing exchange and support for lower income women and women of color, as though they were offshoots of the generic women's movement, white women's movement, what's now been conflated into a vague and boundless diversity. Add a woman of color and stir was the acid comment of one critic of tokenism. The very notion of integration into our movement instead of co-founding and equal beginnings e indicates how this became the great failure of second wave feminism. Good intentions were rampant, but so was ignorance and sometimes arrogance. Uh, this is um, one of the writers by Yong Soon Min, a Korean American, an activist and curator and what have you, and teacher. One on the left is by Julia Tsunajani, Navajo. 
who is one of my favorite artists. So we, and I include myself, all too often manage to place ourselves in the colonial position of gatekeeper, in control of the overview, giving voice as though it were ours to give. As Audre Lorde wrote, it's not those differences between us that are separating us, it's rather our refusal to recognize those differences and to examine the distortions which result from our misnaming them. End of quote. Postcolonial scholarship has put some of these failures in perspective, as has the recognition of the violence of the very act of representation, to quote Edward Said. But I don't think feminist artists have given up yet on the polyphonic voice, the braided chorus of many experiences. We're slowly learning to read between the dots to see the flesh and blood beneath the makeup and the make-believe. In 1992, three Navajo graduate students at the University of Colorado, Melanie Yazi, Shir Laura Shirley, and Ken Yazi, used self-portraits in a way to confirm their connections to the land and to reframe the relationship between fake and real. Their installation, Three Little Indians, presented crudely touristic cutouts of Navajo modeled on the conventional head-through-the-hole backdrop with an array of stereotypical Indian pictures. But behind the imposed facade was the place the subjects really live. And you see that on the right with Melanie's self-portrait. Translucent, translucent port photographic portraits overlaid on the delicate tracery that is the map Navajo Nation, the land in which they are rooted. The backdrop is reality, the facade is fake. The land base is the context, as is historic displacement from that land base. I know many of my own epiphanies around race and class came while working with the Heresies Collective. Founded in 1976 by about 20 women, I, I remember nine of us were Aries, that's not a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> there were artists, writers, filmmakers, and anthropologists, all white, of course. We published a journal of feminism, art, and politics that lasted 12 years and established a shorter-lived school. Heresies was the first time I felt that I'd written about feminism and left politics within a comfortable context each essay constructed from dialogue with my peers, which included incendiary brainstorming, fierce disagreements, passionate rants, and the inevitable crit self-crit. Criticism, self-criticism, for those of you who've never gone around the circle dissecting virtually everything that was said and done. The various issues of heresies on lesbian feminism, racism, the goddess, sex, propaganda, ecology, media and class, women's traditional arts, and so forth, were each edited by a separate collective and overseen by the mother collective, a process by which heresies created an ever-expanding community that survives 30 years later to the three of us in the audience today. It's this kind of experience that keeps a feminist in the fold. And if you want to know more about heresies, the film, I was going to say, if you haven't shown the film at Smith yet, why haven't you shown the film at Smith yet? But it has been shown in Northampton, and it's coming on at 3.30 this afternoon. Directed by Joan Braderman, who's here in the audience and lives right here in Northampton. I'm assuming that it will be shown at Smith more than once. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to explain these. The one on the left is by Mae Stevens, called Mysteries and Politics during the heresies period. It's her, her works on Rosa Luxemburg and her mother in the background, and Amy Silman, Elizabeth Weatherford, Suzanne Harris, who died very young, unfortunately, Joan Snyder, Betsy Damon, and I think Harmony's in there someplace. Anyway, there, there were a couple of these pictures. Oh, Pat Steer at the left. And the one on the right is also a heresies thing. It's uh, called A Room Full of Mothers by Sabra Moore who also lives in New Mexico, or I do. And uh, that's my mother on ice skates <laughs> at the left there. I, I didn't remember teaching cocoa ice skating. But. 